All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Football Focus Weekly, the radio show. I am the pet man, Matt Morrow. As always, uh, Football Focus Weekly is sponsored by Mies and Claus Collective. For all your food consulting needs, make sure you visit mepcollective.com. Also, we are sponsored by our own CFI Spring Showcase, which is Saturday, May 18th at West Mecklenburg High School. Uh, we are proud to say we're over 25 schools that will be in attendance in person um, at our showcase. This showcase is for rising ninth graders, which is class of 2028, all the way through current unsigned seniors, which is class of 2024. So if you're a player, you want recruiting um, exposure and the potential to earn an offer in person from college coaches, um, please make sure you sign up at charlottefootballinsiders.com, only $99.00 best deal going around if you go to other college um, camps on your own it's going to be at least 60 70 dollars and you're only going to get seen by you know that school uh so i mean this is the best deal going is right here in charlotte you don't have to drive that far um if you're local um i'll tell you one one crazy thing happened today we had a kid sign up from canada for this showcase, that is a first. We've had kids from New York, Florida, California, but Canada coming to the CFI showcase. I'm, I'm telling you, it you don't realize how big the opportunity is because sometimes in some of these places, they don't have these opportunities. So it's D1 schools through um, D3, NIA, NAIA, JUCO. We've got all levels there. So make sure you go sign up today, shawbonsiders.com. All right, so here to join us on the show tonight, uh, first we'll start off with a special guest. We have uh, Coach Donovan Manning. He is a D-line trainer, and I'll bring him on to the show. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. We're glad to have you, man. Glad to have you. Um, you shouted this out on Twitter. I said, well, you can come be a part of it, too, so... <laughs> <laughs> I know I was, I was catching the show. I was like, I was treating it like it was the pivot. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, the things we discuss can get a little uh, controversial. So um, we're proud to have you as a part of it. Uh, we also got Coach Tatum here. Going on, How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. Halfway through the week, hump days, they say, ready to uh, get through the rest of this. We got testing this week. So. Oof. Grinding through that, but hey, spring ball's almost here, so that's another positive. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you guys ready for that? We are, man. Just, you know, spring stuff's kind of wrapping up. Um, we got a lot of guys in the track, so once they, you know, they've been running and throwing all that stuff, and they come over to us, but then kind of get them more full time is going to be gonna be fantastic. Be downhill from there to summer, so looking forward to it. All right, awesome stuff, man. And then, of course, we got Coach Dub, Robert Washington from Mountain Island. What's, what's up, fellas? What's on? Uh, Wu Tang. <laughs> Wu Tang, baby. <laughs> hey. I, you know, every week I, I never know what I'm going to get with Coach Dub. I mean, he, nah. he came over here a couple of weeks ago from like a remote spa somewhere <laughs> in, the, in the tropics. <laughs> now hey. he got Wu Tang on. Hey, we love the kids. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Coach. <laughs> and then also joining us now is Adam Big Eye Shelby Weber. What's going on, man? What's going on? What's up, man? What's up, Don? What's up? What up? <laughs> because oh man, I can't call it, man. Hope everybody had a great week so far. Oh yeah, so far. Fresh off the practice field, man. How how are things looking at uh, Indy? Oh man, we just you know just stacking days, trying to stay above water, man. That's all. That ain't what you said on Facebook. That's we don't leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start with uh, we got a hire. We got a hire at Garinger. Uh, D'Angelo Lloyd has been named as the new head football coach at Garinger High School. Um, if you are native to Charlotte or you've been around Charlotte for a while, you know that name. Um, he is a former independent uh, star player. Um, when I graduated in uh, 99, uh, he was a big deal. Everybody knew who he was. He went to Tennessee, um, did a great job there, and um, played up on the next level a little bit in the NFL and played in the Arena League. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'll just let's just go around. Uh, what, what do you think about the hire? 
Uh, I think it's a good one. Um, just based off who he is and where he's from. Basically, um, you're from the area, so you know the hardships that Harden has dealt with. You may, I mean, excuse me, not Harden, but Ganja. You know the hardships that Ganja have dealt with. You know the area. You know the kids. You know the expectation, and you know multiple ways to change um, your around. You got multiple ways to change this uh, everything around you. So I think it's good, man. Shout out to him being an independent alum. I don't know him, but congratulations to him. Uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, during the season. But yeah, man, I wish you the best of luck for sure. All right, well said. Who else got something? I think uh, with Coach Lloyd, obviously he's um, his name is known, local legend. Uh, God knows his football. But I think the biggest piece here with this hire that makes it a great hire. He's been coaching Eastway Middle School for the last couple of years. So he's been actually coaching the feeder program to Ganja. So that's what we alluded to um, earlier last week about getting someone that's been in the system, that's been in that program, that's been in their feeder program or just mingling with the feeder program and, and partnering with the local youth coaches. Is um, So he's been coaching. So the kids that he's – that he will have in ninth grade or 10th grade, he's been coaching the last couple of years. I think they even talked about a quarterback, um, his eighth grade quarterback coming up to ninth grade, and he's familiar with them, um, with that particular player. But i like to salute D'Angelo. Congratulations, brother. Going to do work, man. Community needs you. You stepped up. Um, a lot of respect for you for stepping up and taking on that challenge. Absolutely. Well said. Um, Coach Mann, Coach Tatum, you guys want to add to that? I mean, I, I just say, like, like what Coach Dove said, like, hey, he's from there. I didn't know he like, was coaching at that middle school. But, you know, in the article, you know, when he got hired, he said, you know, you, know, you have to be patient, which is what we alluded to. And he's, he came out and said, I, I understand this assignment. Like, I, I know what's going on. Like, no one's – this ain't going to sneak up on me and all this different type of thing. So, you know, the fact that he's, you know, a local legend, you know, everybody knows who he is um, in that area, you know, being an indie. Definitely plays, you know, you know, brings interest to that. Uh, and then, you know, he knows the hardships that Garinger's been on. So, you know, congrats to him. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll see he start getting it turned around. But they start small and, and little wins, man, day by day. You know, praise the little things. And those little things start to get the big things and turn around. But it's going to take a while. And he knows that. Well said. I just think it's a it's a great hire. Um, I don't know him personally. Um, just off what you guys were saying, just him coaching at the middle school in their feeder program, that's huge, especially when you talk about development of kids and getting them into that system and having them understanding what's going on on a, on a different level basis. So, like, I think, and, too, with his playing experience, I know kids, especially in my area, we love to play for coaches who have been there and done that and who can kind of mentor and guide us through, and I think he brings that aspect to the table also. Happy for Yeah, very good. So just to sum it up before uh, we go a little deeper into it, um, like Coach Dub said, I do appreciate the fact that he, you know, is coming from a feeder program. So you know what those kids go through. You have relationships with some of those kids that feed into Garinger. And, you know, having the quarterback, you know, that could potentially, you know, move forward depending on, you know, where he lives and all that. Um, that could potentially move into the school, uh, move up with them. You know, it, it starts the building process where you have that group of kids that grow together and then they become, you know, close knit and then they work together from that freshman year and they have that buy in and that relationship. And then as they grow older, they work out, they get better, and then you never know what can happen, uh, when they become juniors and seniors. Um, I think I shared this before, but the last year I coached in 2014 at Harding, um, my goal was to simply have a JV team. Harding didn't have a JV team for three years. And, you know, my my sole goal when I um, when I got brought in there, um, Coach Akins was the, the head coach um, in, in the name, but, you know, I was doing a lot. <laughs> and um, – I went to the middle schools and started meeting with, you know, the, the feeder programs that fit into Harding. And I told those kids, I said, look, I know you, you're being told that we won't have a JV. You'll have to play varsity. You're going to get beat, you know, every Friday night to a pulp because we don't have enough players. 
And I said, that's not going to be the case. We're going to have a JV team, and you guys are going to grow together, and you're going to get better. And we had one. You know, we brought a JV team back. Um, and then those kids as seniors ended up being key pieces uh, to the Harding State Championship team. So JV is where it starts. It starts with the feeder programs. It starts with getting a group of kids together, getting them in the weight room, letting them go through the battles together. You build those bonds. You build those relationships. And then you get better as a result. So, you know, I think it was a, a really intelligent hire um, for the, the Garinger administration to uh, go ahead and pull that off and uh, bring them into the fold. And, um, you know, based on the article from The Observer, you know, they've been trying to get them over there and um, they were finally able to to do that. So I, I think that's a great thing. Uh, Coach Dub, you got something you want to add here? Yeah, and I think one thing I want to say, um, and not necessarily any high school coaches or coaches because chances are most coaches don't do it, but I'm talking about the people that have influence over these kids, these people that's around the program that's pushing kids to different programs. Leave the Ganja kids alone. Leave those Ganja kids alone that's in those feeder systems because what we see is a lot of kids that might be set to go to Ganja. You got people around them, hey, don't go to Ganja because um, – Y'all not going to win. Y'all going to continue to get beat. And they start getting the kids to come to their schools. There's a lot of Garinger kids on some of these rosters. There are kids that were supposed to go to Garinger on some of these team rosters that's winning right now. Leave those kids be, man. Let that man build that program. Uh, get behind that man and that program. I'm talking about as a community. This doesn't have anything to do with just one particular school. This is about our community as a whole. Because uh, obviously, you know, we could be at different jobs um, th the next day. This is just a job, but leave those kids alone. This is about the community. Let those kids develop um, under Coach Lloyd, and let's see what he could, he could do. And, and then we might be in a more uh, a, a better situation. Yeah, that, that's a good point. That, that's a real good point. Uh, I'm going to bring in the producer, Brandon Black, defensive end extraordinaire from Harden University High School. Uh, producer, what what's your thoughts on the Garinger hire? Um, just. You know, I, I commend any coach that's willing to, uh, you know, take on a job with, you know, that might not have the, the, you know, have a less than optimal reputation at the moment as far as wins and losses and uh, that's willing to take on a build and take on what some might consider, you know, a long term project. And I just hope he gets the support he needs from the administration, the community and everything. And I feel like if he does get that, you know, he can start to, to turn the corner. And like Coach Dub said, you know, hopefully he gets the the kids, um, can get them in there and, you know, not allow them to be deterred. And somehow, you know, he just needs to get the snowball rolling. Snowball rolls, it starts out small, but eventually it gets bigger. So he just needs to get the ball rolling. And, um, you know, I hope he can hope he can do it. But, uh, yeah, he just needs to, the rep and he just needs to get the uh, support he needs. And, um, you know, I wish him the best. And I love to see Garinger turn the corner. Well said, well said. Um, I, I'll say this, um, Coach Lloyd, I, I don't have a way to contact him just yet, but I do want to reach out to him. Hopefully we can get him on the show and talk to him, give him a chance to promote um, his plan for Garinger. And then, if you know, Coach Lloyd, if you see this, if you need anything, you know, I've always supported Garinger uh, throughout the years and helping promote their athletes um, and the coaches over there and to help, you know, spread the word of what you want to do with the program. So, um, if anyone sees this and, and knows Coach Lloyd, please share that with them. And, I'll, you know, we'll be glad to support them. A um, couple comments here. Some people watching tonight. Uh, Jacob Milligan, you got a shout-out for Coach Tatum. What's going on? What's going on? All right. Good deal. Uh, of course, you know, Joe Hughes, chiming in. Wu-Tang is for the children. So. I was thinking it. I just didn't say it. I was definitely thinking it. <laughs> No, we, we, we did establish that early in the show. Thanks thanks to Coach Doug, man. Hey, Pep, you got to tell him your name. You got a Wu name. I do? Yeah. It, expect a Pep. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Moving forward, uh, <laughs> Karen Belk. Uh, thanks for watching, Karen. Good luck to D'Angelo. Remember seeing him play. Good guy. All right. Long time Independence fan. There you go. Good stuff. 
I see Coach Bills. I'll, I'll come back to those in a second. Uh, but also, Joe Hughes says, my boy, D Manning, what's good, my guy? <laughs> Oh, make a little ESPN update. Hey, there you go. All right. Um, <laughs> and then, and then Mr. Bills with several comments that that will leave off camera right now. Uh, but everyone has kind of weighed in on their um. <laughs> Marcus, that's we'll put that one up. We'll put that one up. I I, I appreciate that, Marcus. That's, that's great. The chef. That's great. All right. <laughs> Uh, but the but the some Garens are up where they are right now. Um, you know, I follow a couple of Garinger kids on Twitter, and they do have some talent. There, like like I've always said, there's talent at every school here in Charlotte, and I, I really do hope. I mean, I know how things are in Charlotte, and we talk about it all the time with you know people moving around and doing what's best for them. But I, I really do hope you know some of those kids will stick it out. And I'll uh, give Coach Lloyd a chance um, to come in and, you know, put his stamp on the program. Um, I've always felt like, personally, I would want to be in a place where it's my show. I don't want to go be part of something already established. I want to be the man, no matter where it is. And um, if I got to get it out the mud and do it at Garage on the east side, then I'm going to get it out the mud and do it at Garage. I mean, that's, that's me, but, you know, it's 2024 and, you know, some – some people like, you know, jumping to somewhere else. So that's fine. All right. Anyway, <laughs> we'll leave that where it is. And when we come back here on Football Focus Weekly, the radio show, we're going to talk about seven on seven coaches dictating school workouts. I saw this on Twitter. I retweeted and asked, was it real? And many head coaches said it is. And I can't believe it. But we got to talk about it. So we'll be right back here on WDRB Media, the voice of the community. All right, we're back. And now we're going to talk about, I couldn't believe this, guys. I, I couldn't believe it. Seven on seven coaches telling players not to work out because they got big tournaments on the weekend. Like, where is this crap coming from? Have y'all heard of this? Oh. Uh. I haven't. Well, I've heard of it, but no, it hasn't. hasn't uh, it hasn't affected none of the kids I coach. Um, but that's the that's the new normal now, man. You have seven on seven teams or football seven on seven teams, basketball AAU programs where they want to put their summer values over the team values, and it's unfortunate that a lot of parents or players get affected by it. But I'm here to tell you that you will never get an offer at a seven on camp, seven on seven camp. Which is seven on seven team. They're gonna want you to come to the camp or seven on seven team camps with your high school team, and they're often crazy how a lot of these coaches that have seven on seven organizations they coach themselves. So, are you telling your players to not come to your practice to come to your seven on seven practice? It's ridiculous that he's got to this point with coaches or outside organizations that's not connected to the high school where they feel like they need to dictate what their high school coaches players do. I'm going to tell you something right now, and I hate to jump in because I'm going to let everybody talk on it, but if if it was me and I was still coaching as offense coordinator like, like I was back in the day, I'd be having to – I'd say, look, give me your coach's phone number because we're going to have a talk. Because number one, like, like you just said, Adam, you're not getting a scholarship through this dude who might be coaching somewhere else at another school who's probably trying to recruit you, just being real about it, you know. And then number two – have some respect, you know. I, I think we've lost a lot of that, you know, with some of this outside stuff going on, you know. But all right, who who wants to go next on this? I'll go. All right. Um, I mean, it's this stuff comes down to influence. Let's be real, fellas. Some of these guys are using these kids as an extension of a, the joystick. They're mm -hmm. playing Madden with these kids. And unfortunately, they're playing with these kids' lives. Because uh, it's one thing to have influence, and then it's one thing to give great advice. If you're giving a kid advice to skip a high school team building activity, you are not best for these kids. And I get it. You got influence over the kids, but do the right thing by the kids and let them go to their high school practice. Because the one thing about 7-on-7, 7-on-7 is about 
it's more so about okay who wants to compete because that's what we use seven on seven in high school we use it as somewhere you can compete all it shows me is who wants to compete it doesn't show me how good you are i mean i remember like literally pep this was like last week um and i'm doing my morning duty rounds and then i had a kid kid was in there saying coach man we we did we was in a big seven on seven tournament over the weekend and i said um what was your assignment to cover two he looked i was like what are y'all out there doing and we started talking and it we're out there really doing nothing just stroking these adults egos it's, I mean, we're all competitive. You go off to these tournaments and want to compete. And then, like, again, like the little, little league mentality. And it's not speaking for all 7 and 7 and all little league programs because there's some great ones out here. But the ones that know they're not doing right by the kids, they know. So I don't understand the whole concept, Pep, of telling a kid a big 7 on 7 tournament. Because you think about it. Why do we do 7 on 7s in high school? We do 7 on 7s because it's about chemistry. What are you building on seven or seven teams unless you're playing with the kids you're going to play with in the fall? And then, too, Pep, I think the biggest thing, too, we go back to like what I was saying about the recruiting thing weeks ago or whatever. It's on the parents. Because as a parent, I'm not dropping you off at seven or seven practice if you're skipping your high. If I know as a parent your high school practice is from 7 30 to 12, but then you got a seven or seven practice that afternoon or six or seven. You're going to go to your high school practice. You're going to go home, eat, sleep, then get ready for your next practice. I'm not saying, oh, we're going to skip this morning practice. We go to your seven on seven practice. Like, you know I mean, yeah, a lot of it's on parents, man. Like, if, the kids, are skipping, if the kids are skipping high school practice to go to seven on seven, I blame the parents because Adam, everybody, a lot it's, of it's, it's hard for some of these parents because you got to understand some of these, these leeches, <laughs> that's what they are. Or they're influenced. The parents don't know any better. They trust these guys. That's these true. guys have been with these kids five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is their coach that tr they trust. So they're putting their their, their um, trust in these people. So it ain't always about bad parents. Because I'm with you. It's, it's ultimately the parents' decision. But they don't. They're not looking like they're making a bad decision. I, for me, I feel and I, I can I can't speak for seven on seven because I don't dabble in that, but. Anytime you do something that's outside of an organization or a program, you got to make sure those, whatever you're teaching, whatever the scheme is, it needs to align with that program. Now, I'm all for if a school has a 707 that's in their school and that coach is leading it. Um, it's just like me and the aspect of training. So before I train any kid, whether that be college or high school, I always get the okay or the approval from that coach. That coach tells me like what this kid needs to work on. How can I develop him more? Because the last thing I want to do is develop bad habits for that kid to go back to his school to mess up. So I think there needs to be some kind of hierarchy or some kind of protocol to go through before having these seven on sevens. And I think that would clear the air on most of it. It sounds really selfish, man. I think some of these coaches might have lost sight of the fact that the seven on seven is in place to be a complementary activity. Yeah, and they're treating it as if it's equal. Or somehow, you know, the replacement for the high school is supposed to complement them, let them work on some things, develop certain skills um, further that they can take with them into the season. And they're they're treating it as if it's on the same plane as their high school team, and it's, and it's just not. So um, I think some education needs to help help out these parents because, you know, a lot of a lot of parents out there never played sports um, or if they did, it was, a, you know, a very long time ago and they don't. They don't know what they don't know, as they say. So, but yeah, it sounds like the coaches, these seven on seven coaches, need to be reminded this is complimentary. It's a supplemental thing to their to their high school team. So, yeah, they shouldn't even be put on the same pedestal, not at all. Well, a lot of these seven on seven guys, and I'm not saying every one of them, but a lot of them, just like parents or or people out in the stands that just say random bull crap that don't matter. Like they don't want to, <laughs> they don't want they don't want to jump into the fire and be coach or work at the school or actually be with them every single day. It's like a, a weekend gig, you know, kind of just dabble in the cloud, I guess. Like they don't I mean, but not like like obviously great high school guy uh, coaches, you know, they coach these seven on sevens as well. But let's talk about the negatives, you know, like what we're talking about right now. Like it's just they, they they just stockpile talent and then like Coach Dub said, like they ain't not even teaching real concepts. Like they out there just 
you know, they're just like, you know, I got you, I got you. Like, it, it's a playing basically a bastardized man, and like, they're not teaching anything. And if you ever were to say, hey, don't go to your high school's practice, then yeah, you just out there just trying to either, it's all for money, like, you're charging these kids, and you're trying to get as many kids as you can, you just out there for money, or you're out there clock chasing because you can't play no more. So mm-hmm. that, that that's, that's another aspect of it, but I mean, yeah, like you, like you said, out there in pajamas and glasses, and got the book bag on. So <laughs> it, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, fellas, I want to add something to that. That's like a college coach offering one of your players and not speaking to the coach. If you really care about these kids' development, and I'm speaking to the seven or seven coach, if you really care about these kids' development, <laughs> you'll give their coaches a call. Somebody on their high school staff, you'll give a call to. So you guys can come up, like Coach uh, Manning said, so you can come up with a development plan for those kids. Because I could tell you as a high school coach what the kid needs to work on. If it's a, it's really about development and not about clout. So so here, here's one question that I'll pose. What In what world would not working out help a kid in a seven-on-seven tournament? No, not right. Not. <laughs> that's, that's why like, I was so. Like, so like, yeah. <laughs> that's and but apparently it's a really big deal, you know, because several you know head coaches in this area said on Twitter that they faced this, and I'm like, what positive do you gain by not working out? I, I really don't understand. Like, what is the logic? Can some uh, some of you guys are seven on seven coaches on here? What logic is it to not have a kid work out because you have a big tournament? Look, exploring kids, exploring families, clout chasing, all of that stuff. Because what it is, the same dudes is coaching them on the 707, they're pushing them to other schools. They're pushing, hey, you need mm-hmm. to be over here. Why? Because behind the scenes, they even, uh, well, I can use the facilities. I, I'm not, <laughs> I know, I know what I know. I'm, I'm going to use the facilities. I'm getting facilities for free. Or um, I'm, I'm on the coaching staff. They gave me a T-shirt, right? These kids are being exploited. The families are being exploited. I mean, some of these programs, Pep, I told you before, you go to the game, you look on the sideline, and it's like three or four coaches coaching. Everybody else is like the club. This ain't, I mean, but, but then those high school coaches have to play that game because these guys got the influence. So they got to put them on the sideline. They got to be involved because if they don't, they're going to take the kids with their influence and move them somewhere else. So it's, it's a dangerous game playing, but I think it's bigger than 707. It comes down to the influence and the clout chase, man. All right. So the second thing I want to ask, and, and Rob, you can you can probably talk to this um, at best. Within your team rules, if it was me and I was coaching in 2024, I would say, look, I'd have to have a whole dang on seven on seven slash trainer section that specifies if you are going to go do this, I need to have communication with your seven on seven coach or your trainer. Cause coach, like you said, coach Manning, and I thought that was great. You talk to the coach and let them know, Hey, I'm training your player. Can you give me some feedback? That's how it should be. That's how it should be. But I, I, if it was me, and, and some coaches may have it now, and and some don't. But I, the way it's going, I would have it spelled out. Like, look, this is what you need to do if you want to do this. These are the steps. I need to talk to them. And if you don't want to talk to me, then you don't need to be a part of that organization because they don't have your best interest at heart. Period. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, by rule, we the summer and spring's not mandatory. Now, I mean, no, no, I'm not saying mandatory, but I'm saying if you're going to go play for somebody, I need to talk to them. Well, you have to have the support of your school first. You got to mm-hmm. have the support of your administration. Because mm-hmm. if you come down on them, I mean, these parents are smart. I mean, most of the parents out here, like Don Staley said, they want to make their kids comfortable. Our job is to make them uncomfortable. So mm-hmm. what they're going to do, they'll email around you, email the top, and it becomes so much of a liability that we can't mm-hmm. do it. But if that was to take place, it would have to take place after official tryouts. Once your team and you're in season, you could put together like team rules and stuff like that. 
But unfortunately, in in the months of April, May, June, July, it's the wild, wild west. Mm. That is crazy. Yeah, so here's the other part of this. And, and I trust me, 707 has some positive things to it. But I've, I've always said this. I'm going to keep saying it. We need to have, one, more regulation. And, two, you guys need to have more time with your kids. Uh, some of these schools are putting together their 707 teams. By rule, I know you can't coach them, but they have those liaison guys that can go coach the 707 team, well, the people that you can trust. I don't think um, the head coaches can't coach them, but, like, maybe, like, your assistant coach can coach the 707 team, but your head coach can't. Mm-hmm. I yeah, think, but, but I think in the grand scheme of that, if you're talking about assistants, I would have my OC and my DC. That way you keep it, you know, within house. If, if we're going to do that and call the 707 team, those are two that need to oversee – a whole parts of your offense and defense, just keep it simple. And then they learn in the scheme at the same time. Yeah. Hey, but, I, I, but, go ahead, Coach. But, but by state rules, and I, I want to say this, there's a lot of people breaking the rules because by state rules, no no one a part of the program, I don't care if you're a volunteer, you're a paid staff member, could be coaching those seven or seven teams. I know a lot of people said the head coach, but what the rules read, if you're around the school, you cannot coach these teams. And unfortunately, people are breaking the rules. But more so than anything, going back to what we talked about a couple weeks ago, kids shouldn't be doing seven or seven in the spring anyway. We're gonna get to that in June, in June and July. We're gonna be at plenty seven or seven. But well, doing that, I, 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 coach, I feel you, but it, it doesn't advance so far now. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I think it's, I think it'd be something good for them um, because, like I know, like Independence, like we have kids playing on seven or seven teams. They have kids playing on AAU basketball teams. I mean, it give you something to do because right now during the during the spring you can't do nothing but lift, run, and like so like right now you really can't do too much on the field. So you doing seven on seven with your friends on your dad team, um, and you're still running probably some of the stuff we're gonna run or run something different or learn different variations of. It, it's good for you because you actually getting some work in. Because right because- now, I mean, like like say for like right now, we about to enter spring ball. Right now, you can't go outside and have a seven on seven. With your with your with your high school team, but me and my high school players can go have a seven on seven team and play locally in Charlotte, and mm-hmm. just get better at what we do. So it kind of like it's almost like saying like AAU basketball, it's an extension of a season outside of your high school season until your actual season start. Because a lot of because a lot of the top programs they take June off, so the kids can go play summer league for their high school team. The summer league only lasts the month of June, then they pick back up AAU in July. So it's like with seven on seven, it's like right now, it's kind of like, okay, boom. We can't do nothing till May as a team wise, as far as throwing the football. Okay, cool. Then in June, we pick up seven on seven. Right. So I think it's cool having seven on seven. Now, now I think the dynamic of seven on seven has tr- dramatically changed because of social mm. media, yeah. not because of what's being played on the field, because of social media. And like, and I think it hurts the programs that actually are helping the kids, like taking kids on college visits, letting them see, letting them travel the world with 707, and they run a good, respectable program. But I think I do think, I mean, we influence playing 707. We just want you to, if you're doing something, do something that is going to benefit you. Like running track. That's what they need to yeah. be doing. Like because, it, uh, <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> I got a question. What's, what, what, what's one of the things that you, that, that you will approve on overall from last year? Not because I know what you told me. What would it be? We just got uh our team we just need to get stronger. No, you, uh, you said speed too. Yes, yes. Stronger, you get faster, you get faster. Yeah. Also with track though, also with track, okay. If I have two track meets a week, potentially. Who, you gonna have, no, you're gonna have potentially like if we got 20 kids that need to get fast, we ain't gonna have four or five relay teams that, that's able to run like every track meet. So I think kids need to practice track as well. To get faster, but after you know, track is, is pretty much from say. So we get our school two fifteen. I use independent for example. We get our school two fifteen. My track pad is gonna be from start at two thirty, no later than four o'clock. I'm gonna get out potentially. Okay, seven on seven practice. Most of these coaches, they either work for the school in some form or trainers. They work for the school. They get out of school. They or they get out of work. The average person get out of work five o'clock. So if I'm gonna do seven on seven practice at seven o'clock. 
I can do what my coach, what Coach Washington want me to run track. I'm gonna go do what Coach Washington want me to do. Okay, Coach Washington gonna say, "What you doing for the rest of the night?" I got seven on seven practice. So now I'm pleasing my head coach, and I'm doing what he wants me to do. But then mm-hmm. I'm actually getting some work in football wise because most guys right now that run track and play football, they can't participate in the football stuff right now unless unless they are pretty much like haven't qualified for regionals or anything like that. So now coaches. So now your track team's starting to get a little smaller around this part because if you ain't qualified for regionals or nothing like that, you probably could still practice. But now if I'm the coach, I'm focusing on new people that we're going to get ready for regionals. Okay, you go to regionals, you don't qualify for state. All right, boom, we see you. Go to football or go wherever you want to do. Now I'm focusing on these people. So I think that the kids have the ability to do both things. But like I said, it needs to be mapped out. It needs to be scheduled. It needs to be planned. But yeah. if my track coach, if my coach, if my football coach say, look, Adam, you need to get faster. Coach Rob, track coach, on the, track coach and football coach. Hey, you go out there with Coach Rob, you run, you don't qualify for regionals. When you get done with track, you come back out here to football. And then mm-hmm. it can be some days where hey, we got an independence, we work it out. Hey, Coach Rob, what you doing for practice today in track? Is it okay if Coach, if Mr. If Adam come to track practice for 45 minutes, then come to football? It's all it's all communication. Now, like I, now I mean, like Rob probably won't let his his best run on the team go do both because we want him focusing on one thing. But if I can go dump my track workout in 30 to 40 minutes and we still got football, I can leave track, then just go to football. Or I can leave football, then go to track. So I think yep. I think I, everything benefits the kids to help them. But like I say, it has to be structured. Like It needs I, to be structured the right way. And when you talk about that structure, I think we're we, we missing the point, too, is when we're talking about how old these young men are. Like you asking the kid to com- compartmentalize himself in a way that says, okay, I need to take these pieces from track. And then I go to a seven on seven, which might give me bad habits, but then take away the pieces that I need and then apply it to football. And I think that's where the coaches are getting in between that, that, that realm there, because some kids can't go to seven on seven and say, Hey, let me just take what I need and and move on. They'll develop that habit within that long span of time. And then the the high school coaches have to reteach the good habits. Mm. So it's like you having to backtrack. It's just like in my sessions, if a guy misses one, I have to backtrack what I taught. And it takes away from everybody else if I'm having a joint or if I'm having a single. So it's like you got to have that that talk with that kid and say, hey, this is what you need to take from this, and this is what you need to take from this. Yeah. And Coach Ben, go, 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 Coach Ben. No, and, and seven on seven has become so popular because you think about it, like, like outside of football, we're all football coaches. Like, we love football. But, like, the most popular sport is basketball. And the reason is because you are a seed. You don't have a helmet on. You don't have a shoulder pads on. You people see your face. Or your mm-hmm. friends can see you. So seven on seven is that exact same thing, but you ain't got no pads on, you ain't got no helmet on. So you, you give you got guys out there with the highlight films, and I, I like watching them. And you know, you got Friday nights in Carolina, and all these dudes that do all these great videos and highlights. <laughs> now I can share it with my friends, and I'm going out there, I'm head tapping guys, and I'm going like this down the down the sideline. <laughs> you, you just you're being seen. So like that's why it's getting popular, and, and nothing wrong with that stuff. But that's why they they go into these. Hey, I got to go to this tournament. Cause you know my, bo- my boys are out there, you know I'm gonna go out there and show out with them. So, and then which one's more, which one's more, you know, popular to do? Do that with your boys, and you know maybe get on a film or go grind in the weight room or after school with the coach. So it, it goes both ways. Well, I want to say I want to piggyback on what Coach Manning said, because uh, uh, kids can go somewhere and learn bad technique, then they come back to your school. You try to teach them the right technique, and you argue with them for a whole two three months. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, my seven on seven coach taught me this. It was wrong. <laughs> All right. Uh, to sum it up, let's go to the comments. Um, th- th- thank you, Mr. Billups, for all your um, commentary. I had to scroll through it. <laughs> RJ George says, I can witness myself. Kids get offers from seven on seven. Last year, a kid moved up in the rankings because of seven on seven. But I have a seven on seventeen. We don't allow our players to miss school events for seven on seven. Okay. Well, I mean, I know some some people do watch, you know, some of the the big name guys, you know, in the seven on seven tournaments and stuff. But I mean, I, I know some of those guys get offers in it after you see a highlight or something. But I, I mean, I would say those guys are going to get that offer anyway. I mean, and pe- pe- but it's a small percentage. The, the oh boat, yeah, the, very, the very boat, small, very small. The boat, because I'm not saying it never happens. That's not a blanket mm-hmm. statement. So you might have witnessed someone get an offer on seven or seven, 
But a hundred percent of the offers that come out in the spring before camp happens at high school workouts. Mm. The coaches come into the workouts of their high school coaches. That's where a hundred percent of the offers are going to, well, let, let's not say a hundred percent, but a good percentage of the offers are going to come from. Yeah. Uh, Ty John Pringle said that seven on seven coach. We never tell a player to choose, choose us over their high school. Our mm-hmm. job is to help strengthen the skills of the players when they come to seven on seven. As far as the organization, I coach, but yeah, you're one of the good ones. Yeah. You're one of the good ones, coach. Um, <laughs> Everybody ain't got that um ain't got that mindset. Um yeah. Uh so I mean that's a great segment right there for about seven on seven. Um I, as much as we talk about it, I, I do believe there are some good things, but I really my hope is and and I don't know if we can do it, but I, my hope is every school around gets their own seven on seventeen. We yes. can work with them in the off season, and we can cut some of this stuff out, man. I mean, I, that's what we really need. That's what we really need to have. All right, but when we come back here on Football Focus Weekly on WDRB Media, I'm gonna go solo and talk about the cop. Who got a dog? Hey, hey, that's that's my vicious mean tortoise. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> it sounded like a killer back there, though. <laughs> I'm gonna go solo <laughs> and talk about the, the uh, top uh, class of 2026 defensive lineman in the Charlotte Metro area. So we'll be right back here on uh, WDRB Media, the voice of the community. All right, we're back, and I'm gonna go solo, give the guys a break, and I'm gonna talk about my top. Uh, class of 2026 defensive line rankings for the Charlotte Metro area. Um, if you've been here with us for a while, um, I focus on the 2025 class for the first uh, about seven or eight shows that we've had here um, doing the radio show. Uh, now we're going to move into 2026. And we're going to start with defensive linemen. So I'll do five, and then we'll give you a couple others to watch. So uh, number five on my list is K.J. Gillespie from Mooresville. Um, I've, I've been following him for a couple years. Um, I, he has always had the size and the potential, and now he's starting to realize, you know, who he can be. Um, 6'3", 245 pounds. He can play both inside and as an edge player on the defensive line. Was all-conference selection last season. He's starting to gain recruiting attention and offers. He's got offers from Charlotte. Kentucky, Virginia Tech, and West Virginia. Um, you look at the film, he's got good speed coming off the edge that can affect the quarterback uh, quickly after the snap. Uh, great burst in short spaces, chasing down ball carriers. Um, and it's obvious he's been coached well. Um, there's a highlight where he uh, performed a technique called a wor- uh, wrong shouldering. Um, that's a technique he do against a pulling guard. He does it well, blows up a counter play that the offense is trying to run. And um, I think he's got a bright future ahead of him over the next couple years. Uh, number four is Rodney Dunham from Myers Park. Um, and, you know, I saw this kid last year um, against R.G. Kill, and he he was very impressive. Um, he's one of the hottest recruits in the state currently. He's 6'4", 215 pounds. Um, excellent speed getting around the edge against slower offensive tackles. Um, there were clips where he's just getting around him before they can even get his hands on him. Um, looking at his highlight film, um, he had some really impressive plays where he got interceptions from the defensive end position by getting his hands up, uh, showing some ball skills and even just plucking the ball out of the air or tipping it to himself. He affects special teams. He had a field goal block, uh, breaking through the middle of the line. Um, he's got offers currently from East Carolina, Charlotte, South Carolina, Old Dominion, North Carolina, Duke, Virginia Tech, and Florida State. Um, and he's number four. <laughs> it's a great 26 D lineman here in this area. All right. Number three is Elijah Littlejohn from West Charlotte. Um, just pure explosiveness off the edge. Um, he's got multiple Division I offers because of that. Um, when he, when I watch his highlights, he just gets in the backfield so quickly and disrupts offenses repeatedly. 
um, against really good opponents and against, you know, lesser opponents, it was consistently the same thing on film. Six foot three, 215 pounds. Um, he's got two years to add weight to his frame before he can go into the next level. Um, offers currently from Michigan, Virginia Tech, Tennessee, Wake Forest, Georgia Tech, Indiana, Liberty, Troy, Marshall, East Carolina, Texas A&M, South Carolina, Temple, NC State, North Carolina. <laughs> incredible, incredible, um, highly recruited young man. Um, statistically, he had a strong year as well last year with 86 total tackles and 12 sacks. Um, really, really good player. Um, if you're a knowledgeable person to high school football, you should know who the next two are, but we're going to go through it anyway. Uh, number two, um, the class of 2026 Charlotte Metro D-line rankings, Andrew Harris from Weddington. Um, I'll tell you, one of the twins, his twin is going to be number one. We'll talk about him in a second, but six foot two, 225 pounds. Um, I, I can go through the list of offers, but it, it's it's going to take me a minute. But the latest offers from Ohio State that just tells you, you know, how good this young man is. He's got ACC interest and offers, SEC offers, um, offers from you know most big schools that you could think of. Um, when you look at the film, he's got really impressive strength to take on blocks, um, including double teams and shed those blocks and make tackles for losses in the backfield. Um, other thing I really love persistent hands, you know, you see the best D linemen always working their hands. Uh, he does that really well to shed blocks and, um, work moves from a pass for a standpoint. Also, um, he can line up inside or outside on when he's lined up at defensive end. He's got great speed on the short corner against offensive tackles. Um, he's really been coached. Well, he's impressive. Um, and uh, he just honestly looks advanced beyond being a current sophomore. I mean, that, it's incredible. Um, and then number one was Aiden Harris from Weddington. Um, and I'll be honest with you, the only separator between those two was Aiden was named a defensive MVP at a state championship game. Literally, that's it. I mean, there's no other way I, I could have tried to separate him, but that was it. Um, he's got the same offers <laughs> that his, um, his twin has. It's incredible. Um I know that it's smart for those colleges to try to get a package to give. So that's that's how good these these two are. Um, highlights once again, he's been coached very well. Uh, the one thing that really sticks out about Aiden, he knows how to play half a man with advanced techniques as a defensive tackle. That's something you hear um, coaches talk about um, a lot. Uh, D line coaches, and I know Coach Manning could probably attest to that um, when we bring him back on, but. Um, it, it's easier to play half a man, and, and that way, you know, you can work that half and get to the quarterback or get in the backfield and make plays. Um, he's got great get off at the snap. Um, and then, and talking about that state championship game, he blocked the punt, intercepted the pass after tipping itself, tipping it to himself at the line of scrimmage. Um, excellent quickness, multiple tackles in the backfield on his highlights. He plays with great strength. Um, just, just. An awesome, an awesome player. Uh, so those are the top five um, class of 2026 uh, defensive linemen in the Charlotte Metro area. Uh, some other guys to watch. Uh, Manny Lewis, very good player from Marvin Ridge. He's got offers from Troy, Colorado, and Charlotte. Stands at six foot two and 240 pounds. Incredibly athletic. Um, he, on his film, he's running down receivers <laughs> from the PN spot downfield after they've caught passes. So, I mean, it, it's just amazing. Uh, Miles Funderburg from Providence Day. He is a really good two-way lineman. Uh, he can be evaluated as an offensive line prospect or defensive line prospect. On defensive line, he's more of a defensive tackle at six foot one and 295 pounds. He's got offers from Charlotte and Campbell. Uh, Jason McCallum from Hickory Ridge at 6'4 and 235 pounds. He's an edge prospect. Um, he's got an offer from Eastern Kentucky, great physical frame, obviously, and he's got really good speed. Um, the thing, that's the thing about Jace. Um, Aiden Black from Central Cabarrus, talked about him before, six foot one and 280 pounds. He's got incredible athletic ability for his size. Um, seeing him run down plays from behind at 280 pounds as a sophomore, that is incredible, man. Great athletic ability. And then finally, Antoine Johnson from uh, West Charlotte, six foot two and two hundred sixty pounds. 
all conference interior player, more of a defensive tackle. Uh, he does a really good job in uh, disrupting the interior run game well with uh, penetration. Um, so that 2026 class is something else for real. <laughs> All right, so when we come back here on uh, Football Focus Weekly with WDRB Media, we're going to finish up the show talking about, um, and this is just going to be an open-ended question, the the best game that uh, we have played in as a high school football player. I think that's a fun topic to end the show. So we'll be right back here on WDRB Media, the voice of the community. All right, we're back, and we're going to bring the guys back, and we're going to talk about this final topic here, the best game you played in as a high school player, who wants to go first? Hmm. I'll get mine. I'll, I'll go. Um, right. We, we might have brought this up on here before, but I'm, I'm certain we did. But I'm going to go to my senior year um, with the what we always talk about, the hurricane game, because I think it was us against um, – you know, I went to R, and then we were playing uh, the Concord Spiders, also known as the Fighting McClamrocks. And uh, <laughs> it was rainy. Um, it was just us against them in Charlotte, and I think Independence and Providence. Those were the only two games in Charlotte. All the rest of the games, it got canceled that night, and they were playing either on Saturday or on uh, Monday. So, <clears throat> you know, as a it was a really sloppy, sloppy feel. Uh, it was basically rain, like a slow, steady rain from kickoff to the end of the game. Um, low scoring. I think the final ended up being like 13 to 7, you know, as a defensive guy. I'm, I'm fine with that. So, you know, it was just kind of fun, you know, rainy, just very sloppy, kind of old school, <laughs> old school vibe, as they say. So, you know, kind of, what they say, you know, something like that, hard hitting. You know, it was just real defensive struggle. So, uh, unfortunately, we didn't come out on top, but came down to the wire, came down to, like, the last drive. So, I'm going to go with that one. You know, in that game, um, I was a a very young coach, and um, we decided to institute the spread offense. (laughs) In the rain. (laughs) Yeah. That was – that was – just a snippet of how hard in game planning went in the early 2000s. Right. Exactly. <laughs> oh, who wants to go next? I'll go next because mine is not as, as cool as, as Don and, and, and Webb. So, um, <clears throat> being from Shelby and, and, and Gaffney, but um, because I played ball, like probably league ball at like Greensboro, North Carolina, and uh, lower, lower level football, but uh, we ended up. Uh, playing uh, in our league, um, a team out in uh, Tennessee, Johnson City, and it's traveling out there. And it was their senior night, and it was, I mean, it was it was mountain weather, and it was foggy because they had fog machines out there. And we pretty much played in the haze the whole night. You couldn't even see sideline to sideline. Um, so uh, that was just fun as a player. Uh, ended up losing that game on a, on a uh, walk off for them field goal. Um, still stings, but. It was, it was fun to be a part of. Yeah, it was crazy. You couldn't even see sideline to sideline. Um, I should always remember that one. So, yeah, I wanted to go before uh, the good game started getting on there. <laughs> Man, I'm going to tell you something, Coach. I We lost my junior year. We lost back-to-back games on end-of-game field goals. Oh, my gosh. Mm. See, mine is kind of hard, man. I'm trying to do between the two. We'll let you think, Coach Manning. I, what you got? <laughs> he played in, but he played in a lot of big games, though. So I'm sure. So he's gonna I, be would, too. I think Joe Hughes can attest to this one. Uh, I would say 2012 playoff game versus the Burns Rebels. Uh, that one kind of hit home just because we were the number two ranked team in the country the year before, and we lost to them. Made our record 14 and one in the state final. The tables kind of flip flop and. The next year we got them back. That was a payback game. So, and we were actually down two scores at the half. We came back and won 22 19. I think that was the final. Mm, wow. What high school? Gaffney. Gaffney versus mm. Burns, 20, yeah, 2012. Oh, yeah. Joe, Joe, Joe would love that one. He must be busy. But he, <laughs> I think that I was Joe's picture. I think that might have been one of Joe's pictures for the longest. Like the, yeah. the backdrop of 
the home side from when they played. Mm. Yeah, it was crazy. That was a revenge game. I don't know how that one get. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to see, though, because, see, see, me, I played in some big games, but I don't know if I want to consider a loss the best game I played. Yeah. <laughs> we, well, we won now. But... <laughs> I know what I'm saying. So, yeah. one of my best – I think one of our best games I played in, we lost. So, I don't want to feel oh, like that's a good game. <laughs> so, um, well, if I can get two, probably the best one I played in probably was the game – I scored two touchdowns against Kings Mountain on defense. I don't think that's really been done. Um, if, if somebody can fact check me on that, y'all hit football historians. Uh, <laughs> two, two interceptions by a D lineman for touchdown. I don't think that's ever been done. Oh, but, I got to see video on this. I don't believe that. Yeah, I, I did that. Two interceptions for touchdown in the same game against Kings Mountain. We won 49 0. Mm. And that was the, see, normally at Shelby. The game, if we if we ever start out slow in our old schedule, Kings Mount was like always our third or fourth game. And that's normally why the time we turn it around. But I think probably the best game I played in in high school, we lost um the Burns my senior year and senior night. Um Burns was kind of running the county at that point. They won they run they won the conference championship, I think maybe three years in a row on the Matt Bean. Mm-hmm. But I think they used to beat up on all they beat up on all the county teams. From my freshman year to senior year, almost, uh, and we had a game, man. We was winning. Um, you know, it was a tie game. Burns came down through a five yard curl, took it fifty yards, uh, went up seven, and we ended up losing. But that's probably one of the biggest games, um, one of the biggest ones I played in the Shelby. But yeah, you know, because a lot of other our games be blowouts. So, <laughs> <laughs> so humble. But I will say though, I'll probably say as far as being at Shelby. My four years, probably the best game. I didn't play, so I didn't want to consider this the best game because I didn't play in it. But my sophomore year, we played Crest. It was a Friday night, and it was pouring down raining. Don, Don, you might have been at Gardner Webb. I think you might have been a freshman. No, 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 no. You might have been a freshman at Gardner Webb or you're a senior at Gaffney. It was pouring down rain that Friday night. Uh-huh. So our objective was I had Coach Lance where I had just took over. He said, we're going to pull up late. So we – we warmed up and stretched at Shelby, got on a bus with nothing but our cell phones, fully dressed, drove to Crest, got there at like 7 o'clock, got off the bus, ran on the field, start stretching, warm up again, pouring down, ran it, boom. We turned around and played that Saturday night. Oh, my God. Saturday afternoon. Oh, my God. We won the game 9-3 to three in overtime. <laughs> wow. Hey, look, hey, it was three to three. So on this press team, if you want to talk about names, you had Jonathan Bullard. That's that that plays for the um Vikings now, I believe. He's been in the NFL for about eight or nine years. Mm-hmm. Raheem Ledbetter was like the top safety in the country at one point. Had a had a hit on YouTube back when YouTube videos started going viral. He had a viral video of him. I don't know what school the boy went to, but it called Raheem Ledbetter Lays the Wood. And Florida, he, he went Florida. He damn near paralyzed a kid on the high school football field. Oh, good gracious. He had Dane Rogers who mm. went to Clemson, Quentin Patterson who signed yep. to NC State. So you played, we were playing, you had Harvey McSwain, track guy. So we played against all these top players, and it was three to three. The same inside zone play <laughs> we were trying to run all night. Busted the second play of overtime, and we won the game. Mm. So as far as like being like a, a young kid on varsity, mm. being able just to watch a game and see all those big time because on our side we had we didn't have no power five guys. We had a we, no, we had one we had Carlos Ray. Carlos Ray was our only power five guy that went to do, and he mm. played deep. So other than that, we didn't have no big time corners and linebackers going here and there. So for us to beat them at Craig, oh man, that was amazing as a team. <laughs> that was amazing at Tim Gray. Well, in my 30 seconds, I will share that um, <laughs> my favorite game, we actually won my junior year. We were um, playing Piedmont, which was the annual battle for who wasn't going to finish last in the conference. <laughs> and we beat Piedmont. And for some reason, football Friday night was there. I have no idea why. <laughs> but we beat them in overtime. And they came up, they interviewed um, our coach at the time, Howard Barkley, great, great guy. Um, and, and it was it was on Halloween night. It was homecoming in Halloween night. And, um, you know, we had, a, we had a good time. We had a good time on that one. So thanks, guys, for sharing us, uh, sharing with us those great memories. And, you know, we'll continue to do some of these segments going forward. It's always good to look back. 
Um, all right, I want to thank Coach Jonathan Manning for joining us. Uh, yes, Coach Ian Tatum from Walkertown High School, as always. Adam Big Eye Shelby Weber, the linebacker coach at Independence, the defensive man extraordinaire Brandon Black from Harding University High School, I'm the pet man Matt Marr. Thank you for listening to Football Focus Weekly here on WDRB Media, the voice of the community. Make sure you keep it locked in to the best high school football show in the Carolinas and beyond. Have a good week.